So hi everyone, welcome to our um, Authors at Google series. Um, today we have Gabby um, Bernstein. Um, she's a, according to the New York Times Sunday Style section, she's a, a, our next generation guru, a motivational speaker, a life coach, and an author. Um, her new book is Spirit Junkie, we, which you can get for a Google discount for $10 right over there. And um, you can take it away, Gabby. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. I got word this afternoon that it is assessment time at Google. So hopefully I can calm any nerves that might be happening during assessment time and help you raise your own personal assessments today. Um, but uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you for showing up. I am out here on my book tour for this new book, Spirit Junkie, which is my second book. My first book came out in 2010, and it's called Add More Ing to Your Life, A Hip Guide to Happiness. Ing, I-N-G, stands for inner guidance, not the other I-N-G. <laughs> but it's inner guidance, not the bank. And uh, uh, I've been practicing and teaching principles for transforming your perceptions and creating positive changes in your life. And I've been teaching this work for the past six years. And I came to write this second book as a result of many of my readers. My first book came out, and many of the Ing readers came to me and said, we love this book. It's so prescriptive. It's really helping us. I, I love taking all this action in my life, but I want to know more about how you became the happiest person you know. How did you change your perceptions? How did you overcome your fears? How did you get over addiction? How did you get over work addiction, love addiction, drug addiction, all the different things that each of us in some corner of our life deals with in some way. And so I, I had to listen to that call of my readers. And I was inspired and guided to write this new book, Spirit Junkie, and really put my story on paper and be very authentic about who I am and what my experiences have been so that I could not only be a genuine messenger, but also be a guide for those who are inspired by my story. So throughout each chapter in every book, there's my own personal anecdotes of how I've experienced my fear-based illusions and how I've transformed them. And within every chapter, there's also beautiful guidance. There's tips, which I'm going to give you many of them today. And so it's not, a, it's not just a memoir. It's a memoir-style guidebook is what I've written. So it gives you this opportunity to soak up someone else's experience, be inspired by somebody else's story, but in the same moment, take on your own experience of creating, whether it be a spiritual relationship or you could call it a relationship with your own internal guidance system or activating your inspiration or creating more life flow. A big, a big thing that happens when people come to my lectures or come to my groups or read my books is that a common through line with most of the people that come to me is that they're feeling as though at least one corner of their life is not flowing naturally. They're feeling like, OK, I think things could be dialed up a little bit more in my career area. Or I have a great relationship to my finances, but I'm a complete mess in my romantic relationships. Or there's some corner that feels as though it could be more amplified. It could be more inspired. It could flow more naturally. Or maybe it's every corner. Many people come to me and they say, across the board, things are tough. I'm in fear. And so all of my work is to help my readers and my listeners my audiences learn to shift their perceptions and create change in their life. And so what I'll do today is I'll give you a little bit of a background, a background about how I became the happiest person I know, how I became a spirit junkie. And then within that story, I'm going to give you some guidelines for you to start to do the same. And the purpose of this book and my, my goal for this book was not to say, OK, here is my story. Here is how I did it. Here is how you have to do it but rather just to create a platform for you to crack open to have the willingness to make your own change and to help you create a relationship, a spiritual relationship or a, an inspired relationship to your own inner guidance system of your own understanding. So this isn't about you just saying, okay, I'm gonna take her work and do it my way. It's about you opening up and creating your own path through the guidance I'll give you. So throughout my experience of writing this book, I really tell the story of how Throughout my life, from adolescence to the present, I have been hearing this knock on the door, this inspiration, this inner dialogue, this voice within me that has said, be great, be wonderful, love yourself, have an incredible life. You can do this. You can have what you desire. You can achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. 
And each of us has that loving voice within us. Each of us has that intuition, I call it your ing, your inner guide, that loving presence within you that is like, yes, you rock, you can do this. But at some point in time, most of us at a very young age, we pick up this negative belief system. We pick up the beliefs of the world, we pick up the fears of our parents, we pick up the fears of, our, of, our, of the news, of the people on the playground, of our teachers. At some point in time, we pick up this one negative mad idea that becomes like a virus in our mind. And these different limiting beliefs come to each of us in different ways. For some people, it might be just something as simple as maybe your parents didn't pay attention to you. And so you feel, I'm not good enough because when I was six, my parents didn't pay attention to me. And this, it could be as simple as this, or it could be something much more traumatic that you know, all of us have different pain experiences throughout our lives. But at some point in time, that negative belief system is imprinted within our emotional being and we recreate that belief system. We replay that negative thought pattern. We take that negative thought pattern, bring it into our present moment, and we project it onto the future. And it becomes like this spiral and we become stuck. We stay cornered in these negative patterns. I'm sure most everyone in this room, in some area in your life, feels as though you keep replaying the same crazy crap over and over and over again. And, and just get honest with yourself right now. You don't have to get honest in front of all of your coworkers, but get honest with yourself right now and just be really clear with yourself of what are the areas where I'm replaying all that stuff? Where am I saying to myself, I'm not good enough? In what ways am I replaying that belief system that I picked up as a kid? It's something as simple as, I'm not feeling like I can have that career, or growing up with the experience of lack in your home and then believing in lack and never feeling as though you can make more money, or seeing a divorced family and seeing that you know, I can't have a powerful, loving relationship because this is what I grew up around. And so for me, this was the case in many different corners of my life. I was this adolescent girl having an existential crisis, and I felt as though I was really confused when most of my contemporaries were worried about the prom and you know what they're having for lunch I cared more about why I was here I always had this deep desire to know well, what is the purpose what is my purpose why am I here at this time and there was this, this 16 year old girl and this this crazy mindset of what's going on and as many young people I experienced a lot of depression I, I felt as though I was just stuck I felt as though I was misunderstood and so for me, I grew up in the suburbs with this yogi mom and a hippie dad, and I turned to my mom for guidance. I said to my mom, listen, I see you walk into your meditation shrine every day. I hear that mantra coming through the door. I smell the incense pouring out through underneath the door. What goes on in that room? I see you go in crazy and I see you walk out calm. What goes on in that room? I want some of that. And so I said, if I want what she has, I gotta do what she does. And so as a 16-year-old girl, I turned to my mother and I said, show me what you got. Give me that meditation practice. Teach me what you're doing. And so my mom sat my ass down on a meditation pillow and she taught me how to meditate. And so at 16 years old, I was desperate. I was willing. I had this deep desire to change. I needed a solution. And so I allowed my mom's words to come through me. I allowed the mantra to come through me. And I began, at the time, what began my meditation practice. And so I felt this amazing connection from the beginning stages of my practice. I started to feel that within five minutes of sitting in stillness and deep breathing and practicing the mantra, that I could actually feel more calm. I witnessed my extremities begin to tingle. I felt like I was connecting to a much greater energy than the energy that I was just dealing with on my day-to-day -day life. I felt inspired ideas come forward. I felt, most importantly, peace. I felt a sense of peace, a sense of oneness, a sense of being good enough, a sense of being understood even though nobody else was around. And so this was a really neat time for me. It was this beautiful seed that my mom had planted that would then become the catalyst for many changes in the future. But like most smart ass adolescent girls, I thought that there was a better way. I said, okay, that's cool, I got that now, but there's gotta be a way better way than this. So I did what most kids do, which is, you know, I rolled a joint and drank a 40. And I said, okay, this is, this is the other way, right? It's something out there is going to make me happy. Something beyond me is going to be my source of peace. And so for several years, from 16 to about the age of 25, I was on a big search for that outside source of happiness. I was looking forward to my credentials. 
I was looking for it in my relationships. I was looking for it in a pair of shoes. I was living in New York City when I graduated college, and at 21 years old, I started a public relations business representing nightclubs. And so I was out there feeling like, okay, now I have arrived. I have this credential, and it says president on my business card, and I'm 21 years old, and I am hot shit. Sorry, can I curse at Google? I'm not sure. <laughs> I guess so, you know, it's comfortable here. Um, should have asked that first, right, Alex? Um, so meanwhile, I, I'm sitting here thinking that I'm this great, this great thing because I've got these outside credentials. I've got this fast-paced New York City lifestyle. I, I've, I have it made. This is working for me. Meanwhile, that search became this addiction, looking for more happiness. Once I would get that client, I needed more. When I had that relationship, I needed a different relationship. And I constantly felt like I was this hamster in a wheel, searching and searching and searching for happiness and inspiration outside of myself. One day at a time, I kept looking further and further and further. By the time I turned 25, I had a really hardcore revelation that that was not where I was going to find it. By this point in my outward search, I was emotionally, spiritually, and physically bankrupt. I had, I had no f real friends, no strong inspiration. I had found myself really addicted to the New York City party scene and feeling like that became my home and my lifestyle, and that reflected in some really nasty habits. I also would see myself just up at night doing God knows what. But in the midst of all this, there was still that inspired voice within me. There was that loving voice, that power voice within me that said, there's something coming, there's something greater. I'd be up at 3 a.m. at after hours parties in New York City saying to God knows who, I'm going to be a motivational speaker and a self-help book author. <laughs> and somehow I believed me. I really believe this. I intuitively, psychically knew that there was this thing coming, even though it did not reflect in any form the life that I was living at that time. And so by the time I turned 25, I thought to myself, OK, this is not working. Life is not flowing. And that divine moment when I said to myself, there has to be a better way. I had that moment of surrender. And so this is the first lesson I'm going to give you today, which is that all you need to make any change in your life is the deep surrender and the willingness to change. And so I had that. It was October 2nd, 2005, at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I was sitting at home, and I was coming down from God knows what. I was you know, late nights, whatever it was, all of the crazy crap that I had been putting into my body, all of the terrible ways that I had been living, and I was writing in my journal and I wrote, God, universe, whoever is out there, I need a miracle. There has to be a better way. This was the moment that I fully surrendered. This was the moment that I said, show me what you got. I woke up that morning and I heard a really loud internal dialogue a really strong intuition that said, get your life clean and you will live beyond your wildest dreams. This loud voice was very authoritative and very clear and I had no other choice but to listen to that guidance. And so from that day, October 2nd, 2005, I have been listening to that voice. And one day at a time, I have been opening up that willingness to be guided to the teachers, the lessons, and all of the universal guidance that we receive once we become willing to change. And opening my heart one day at a time to make these shifts within my own life. And so it's that beautiful line, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And this is the case for me, and I'm sure it will be for many of you in your life. When you, once you make that willingness to change, the book falls off the shelf. Or the teacher shows up in a form that you could have never imagined. Or, or you hear something on the radio, or you meet a cab driver, or some enlightened conversation comes into your realm that all of a sudden is that shift that you needed to make that change and create that catalyst that becomes your greatest accomplishment, your greatest shift. And so that's all we need at first is that slight willingness. That willingness that I had, that desire to change, that moment to shift was all I needed to become the woman I am today to live that life beyond my wildest dreams. And so when I became ready, I opened up and I said, okay, I'm ready for change. But what's beautiful and what's the main purpose of what I teach is that once you make that decision to change, you do not have to do it by yourself. You cannot be expected to make these changes on your own. All you need is that slight willingness. 
with that willingness, you open up, and like I said, your teacher will be guided to you like a magnet way faster than you can imagine. And that teacher, I know that Thich Nhat Hanh was here last week. Did you have many of you? I hope every one of you followed that man wherever he was on this campus. Because that was one of my greatest teachers at that time. When I opened up, I, I read pieces in every step. I would sit there in a subway station. I would sit on the grass. I would sit wherever I was, and I would just read piece is in every step. That was one of my greatest teachers. And so Thich Nhat Hanh became my teacher in the form of a book. Marianne Williamson, a great spiritual teacher, became a beautiful guide for me. I would listen to her audio albums like a top 40 hit. And Marianne teaches a metaphysical text called A Course in Miracles. And it became very clear to me that the way that she was teaching the Course was really something that would resonate with me deeply. And that many spiritual teachers come to a path that is their guided path to teach. And it became very, very obvious that I was to be a teacher of these messages. And so I came to her about a year into my practice of studying the Course through her interpretation. And the Course in Miracles is, a, is channeled material, it's, it's metaphysics, it's, not, it's totally non-denominational, but it is the purpose and the message behind A Course in Miracles is that we need to shift our perceptions to create miraculous change in our life. So we need to take our fear-based projections and turn them into a, no, a more loving, more positive perspective so that we can change our thoughts and change our energy and therefore change our life's experience. And so this is quite simple. Our, our thoughts affect our energy. And our energy affects everything outside of us. And so what I learned as a student of A Course in Miracles is that the outside world is a reflection of my internal state. And A Course in Miracles teaches that projection is perception. So whatever you are projecting on your internal movie screen, right? I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I can't get that raise. I can't get that raise. I can't get a girlfriend, I can't get a girlfriend. Like, you know, I suck, I suck, I suck, I suck. Whatever it is, whatever you're walking around with, you are projecting onto your life. That internal projection makes perception. Your internal movie screen is what you're perceiving to be your reality. And so I, I became extremely conscious of what my internal movie screen was saying. I became extremely aware. That's the second step I'm gonna give you. I will recap all of this for you, but it's very, very important to recognize that one of the most powerful tools we have is to become the witness to our thoughts. And so as a student of this messaging, I came to my teacher, Marianne Williamson. I went to visit her at a lecture that she was hosting in New York. And I raised my hand in the audience and I said, okay, Marianne, how would you suggest I carry this message to my generation? And she looked at me and she psychically knew. She said, okay, this is, this is a job for you. I get this. This is what you're going to do. And she said, the, the book, of course, of miracles is written in three sections. And she said, read the text. And the text is really where you begin to embark on that reconditioning, where you learn all the principles throughout the messages of how we choose our fear-based projections, how we project those fears onto others, how we're unwilling to forgive. All of the different ways that fear gets us in a headlock, that's what the text guides us to understand. Then, then she said, do the workbook. This is 365 days of daily meditations where you begin to go through a daily practice of reconditioning your thoughts from fear back to a positive perspective. And then she said, read the teacher's manual and then ask the universe, God, whatever you talk to, ask God how, you, how he plans for you to carry this message to your generation. And so I did just that. I became a student of A Course in Miracles, and I've been asking ever since, how can I carry these messages? And most importantly, the, the main message I got was just, be the student, be the student, be the student. As a teacher, my primary purpose is to be a student every day. And what I've learned in the past six years as a teacher of spirituality, as a teacher of A Course in Miracles, is that the world is my classroom and people are my assignments. So every single moment offers me this divine opportunity to go deeper into fear or to strengthen my faith in love and positivity and a higher level way of being. And so I'm gonna give you some of the tools that I've been practicing as a spirit junkie in the past six years and give you a, a greater understanding of how you can take these tools into your personal experiences immediately. The neat thing that happens when you have that awakening in that moment of, yes, I'm ready for change, and that teacher shows up and you've been given these tools, is that you can create quantum shifts in your life immediately. 
The moment that you choose to shift your perception, a miracle occurs. And the miracle is that you feel better. The miracle is that you raise your energetic thought and therefore raise your energy. And then the world around you starts to vibrate at a different frequency. So think about it for a second. Those of you who have coworkers who walk in, this place is pretty happy, people. I'm not really too concerned about what's going on here. You guys are well taken care of. You're well fed. It's sunny outside. But you have those days when you come into the office and you come in with a really bad attitude, right? Let's just say you, know, you got in late or something's happening at home, and you come in and you've got a bad attitude. When you come in with that bad attitude, I'm assuming that you lower the energy of those around you. People start to get a little bit negative back to you. Maybe those emails are not coming in as quickly as you want. Maybe you're not figuring out the things that you need. You're not given the energetic support that you need to show up for this big job, which you all have, at your highest capacity. So your low level thoughts are affecting your low level energy and therefore affecting your experience in the job or your experience on a date or your experience in the gym. Whatever it is, however you are functioning with low level thoughts, you are affecting low level energy and therefore affecting your life's experience. So all of the things that I'm gonna to begin to teach you are about how you can raise your thoughts, have more faith in a higher level way of thinking and therefore have more important higher level way of being, a more enlightened experience, a more inspired experience. Another part of what this work does is that when we start to shift our perceptions, when we start to see things with a better perspective, when we start to see our experiences as, as obstacles turning into opportunities, or a resentment as a divine assignment to forgive more, or a moment of lack as an opportunity to focus on what we're grateful for rather than focus on what we don't have. When we start to make these shifts within our life, what begins to happen is that we begin to have more faith in that way of being. And so the neat thing that occurs, and this has been my experience in the past six years of practicing the life of a spirit junkie, is that now my choices, my moment to moment choices, are choosing more of a positive perspective. When there's traffic, my first thought is, okay, I welcome the traffic to go away. I, try, I start to think about the ways, or if I'm supposed to be late, maybe I'm meant to be there late. Maybe there's something greater coming. Or if something doesn't happen the exact way that I believe it should happen, I know and my first thought is, there's something way greater coming. So this is just the, type, the types of miracles that occur and the ways that your mind begins to shift when you start to practice these principles in your every corner of your life. And so one of the really neat things that happened for me was that I started to find really divine guidance throughout my life's experience. And I'll give you one example of how that guidance starts to come in. When you invite spirit and inspiration into your life and you start to crack open and start to perceive your ways in a little bit of a more positive perspective, you start to see a lot of synchronicity show up. And so what happens is, is that that synchronicity is always available to us at all times. But our fear-based thoughts block that synchronicity. We cut off communication with our internal GPS. That loving voice is always there, it's always working, it's always saying, go to that room, forgive your boss, they didn't mean to be that way, or choose to see this differently, or yes, you can have that job. Your loving voice is always ready to bring you that loving perspective. But that negative voice within us, that chatter of all of that fear-based beliefs, cuts that communication off. It just cuts it off at the knees. And that communication, when it's cut off, blocks the synchronistic flow that we are all allowed and ready to receive at all times. So that synchronicity of wanting that new job and that perfect employer being sitting next to you on the bus. If you're in a low level thought, your energy is lowered, you won't be smiling and that employer can't talk to you. So you're cutting off the communication. You're cutting off the guidance. So once I opened up to that guidance, I started to see the synchronicity show up in every form. And often that, that synchronicity, particularly early on, will come in the form of your teachers and your guides. And so for me, I started to witness how I opened up to make these changes in my life and I was really ready to, at this point in my life, I had been sober for a while, I put down all of the substances, I had started to recover from my work addiction and I was recovering from my issues with food stuff, but I was still hung up in my romantic relationships. It was a really trippy corner of my life. And so I, I turned to my inner guidance system and I started to surrender again, much like I did on October 2nd. I said, I am willing to see things differently. I am ready to change. I need another miracle. And so I started to pray for this miracle and affirm my desire to change. 
And so I started to get this uh, guidance from the universe. And uh, one of my neighbors suggested that I meet this woman named Ra Goddess. He's like, there's this really groovy woman. She's out there. She's doing great work with women. Much like what you're doing, you should totally meet her. I was like, OK, that sounds cool. A week later, my friend and I are having lunch. And she says, you need to meet my friend Ra Goddess. I was like, oh, this is the second time I've heard this. I, should, I guess I should meet this lady. I email this Ra Goddess. I'm like, hey, Ra Goddess, I guess we're supposed to meet. And I, I put it out there. And, I'm, and she's like, listen, I'd love to meet. I'm out of the country for most of March. Maybe we can meet when I get back. I said to her, well, I'm actually leaving the country in March, too. I'm going to visit this medium in Brazil for a spiritual quest. She's like, oh, I'm going to be visiting the same medium in Brazil the same week that you're there. I said, OK, maybe I'll see you in Brazil. OK. So I go out to Brazil. I don't meet Ra. A week, that, that, on my flight back from Brazil, I'm sitting next to a woman who had been there as well. And she says to me, oh, you live in New York. It sounds like you're doing neat work. You should totally meet this woman. Take this card. Ra goddess. A week later, I'm in New Orleans for Eve Ensler's V-Day. And I'm looking at the lineup of different speakers. And I see 12 noon, Rosario Dawson. And we've got Jane Fonda. And then at 2 PM, Raw Goddess. So it became very clear to me that this woman was going to be some kind of powerful influence in my life in some form. And so I took the universal memo, and I finally found my friend. And I said, OK, Ra, let's meet. Let's take some time to get together. Clearly, we are being pushed into each other's lives. The synchronicity is way too wild. Show me what you got. Let's hang out. So we meet up. And as I mentioned, I was going through a lot of my own personal traumas at this time. I was, I was coaching. I was teaching. But I was teaching young women how to release fear in their romantic relationships. But meanwhile, I felt like a fraud because I was feeling completely fearful in that way. And my willingness to change guided me. So I go and I meet with Ra and I say, listen, you know, I would love to talk about business to business. What are you doing? And she begins to tell me, instead of talking about business, she starts telling me about how she called in her romantic partner and her husband. And she started to beam about how she got over all of her fear-based illusions and came to a place where she was in a much more loving perspective and had this amazing relationship with her husband and was so proud of the work she had done around her romance. And so I said to her, awesome, I want that. That's what I want. And I knew that she had coached people. So I said, do you still coach people? And she said, I only coach a handful of people a year. And they're people that I want to take to the next level. I coach people just like you. And I said, tell me where to sign the check. Where do I sign up? And she then became my guide, became my teacher. That slight willingness opened that door for me to be led to the woman who would be the change maker, who would be the container for me to do all the transformational work that I needed to do to kick this one fear that had been holding me back, had me in a headlock for 28 years. And through the work I did with Ra, I was able to release those chains. And now today, live in a very free-flowing, incredible way. But this is just a beautiful example of how when you do become willing, when you invite that spiritual intervention, when you invite that guidance around you, when you open up the dialogue for that communication, then you can allow that synchronicity to pour into your life and guide you to the right people, guide you to the right book, guide you to the right lecture, guide you to the right bookstore, wherever you need to be to be led to your greatest teacher who will be the catalyst for your change. And so my, my hope for you today, my goal for you today was to open up your mind to start to see the corners of your life where things aren't flowing naturally. To take a little magnifying glass and say, things could be more clear here. I could be happier in this area of my life. I could have more flow over here. I'd like to see things differently here and start to open up and become willing to make that change. And so much like myself, I want to be very clear, this, this shift does not require a lot of work out there, it requires a commitment in here. It requires a daily intention. The world around us gives us plenty of opportunities to think and feel crazy fear, right? All we have to do is just turn on the news. All we have to do is sometimes show up to the office, and then that fear just comes down upon us. Not here at Google, but in other offices. It's not so fearful here. It's pretty groovy. People are riding bikes and you know, doing whatever. But, but in general, we have a lot of chaos that we need to, we wake up in the morning, and it's like we got to put on our armor, because walking out the door is going to give us another opportunity to have fear in front of us. And so we have a lot of work to do to overcome these fear-based projections. And so the first step for each of you is just to become willing to see things differently. 
And so much like myself, I hope for all of you to become conscious and aware of the, way, the ways in which your limiting beliefs, your fear-based projections, your negative thoughts are holding you back. How are they keeping you small? How are they keeping you stuck? How are they lowering your energy? How is your negative energy affecting your life's experience? Right? How are you, when you show up on that date and you're like, I hate going on dates, I suck at dates, right? Is that really attractive? Not really, right? <laughs> I don't think that's very attractive. Or, you know, you show up and you're trying to get your, at your review and you're going in for your review and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, I suck, I suck. You're not supporting your employer wanting to raise you up, right? You need to raise yourself up if you want the world to reflect that back to you. Remembering that the outside world is a reflection of our internal state. And if we want to have the world support us, we have to support ourselves. And so we have to support ourselves with our thoughts first and foremost. So I hope for each of you to take a little brief moment of this story of my experience of how I chose that other way. I lived in that way of fear and projection. And then I chose to see things differently. Now, one of the greatest tools I've been using throughout my practice is the practice of meditation and prayer. Now, prayer can be for you something as simple as setting an intention. It could be your little alarm clock on your Android that comes up in the morning and says, I choose to have a good day today. I choose to see things in a positive perspective. Whatever it may be, just setting a positive intention daily is a massive part of this practice. Meditation. How many of you practice meditation with Thich Nhat Hanh? Did you guys get a chance? To, I, I'm so happy. I'm so jealous. So hopefully you learned something from him. Maybe you can take something from him. But throughout my book, every chapter has a guided meditation. I created a meditation album to accompany this book. So got, having a guided meditation practice, often when you're, if you're a meditation newbie and you've never meditated before, find a guide, whether it be me, go on to iTunes and just Google guided meditation. I'll come up. Other teachers will come up. Thich Nhat Hanh will come up, Jack Kornfield will come up, Sharon Salzberg, all these beautiful teachers. Let these teachers just lead you. Allow that guidance to open up your right brain, which is your creative capacity, a part of each of you that's going to have the inspired ideas that will keep the interweb moving, right? We need you people to be inspired. And to have that loving voice just present in your life. And that when we sit in stillness for five minutes a day, I'm going to prescribe to each of you five minutes a day for the next 30 days. Just give yourself five minutes of stillness. You live in a beautiful environment. You can probably go to your backyard, sit outside somewhere, sit in, on campus somewhere here for five minutes, sit in the sun, listen to your favorite song, listen to a guided meditation, listen to Thich Nhat Hanh, listen to the voice of a teacher that guides you, and just allow yourself to tune into your power energy. Activate that loving presence within you. And all it needs, all that this requires is five minutes of stillness. And so give yourself that. Give yourself that moment of, I choose to see things differently. Maybe you do set your alarm in the morning that says, I choose to see things differently. And just allow yourself to awaken to another perspective. And then also, just most importantly, start to focus on the good stuff, as many people say to say in this business. Focus on what is enlightening to you. Focus on what you do have. Focus on all of the resources in front of you. Whenever you get into a mindset of lack, say, I have the most awesome job on the planet, which you all have a great job, right? I have beautiful employees. I have great lunch. Whatever it is, just focus on the amazing things. And what happens when gratitude is our attitude is that we raise that energy again. And that energy raises our life's experience. So start to st pay attention and focus on the good stuff. And be conscious in every moment of your day when those limiting beliefs come in, when those negative thoughts show up. And be very aware to not judge your fear-based thoughts with more fear. Be very gentle with yourself when you begin this process of paying attention to your thoughts. Because at first you might be like, oh my god, I only think fear all the time. This is a mess. I can't get over this. I'll never, ever get over this, right? But rather than doing that, just start to pay attention. Of, just witness. As Eckhart Tolle says, he says, be the witness to the thinker. So just witness the thoughts very gently. Be kind and forgiving to yourself. I like to say, practice the F word, the forgiveness. And really allow yourself to be really present with that forgiveness practice of really being kind to yourself, being gentle with your thoughts, saying, well, of course I have that negative thought. I've been thinking that thought for 30 years. But you know, today I'm going to choose to see things differently. Be very, very kind when you embark on this process. 
And then a major tool that I want to leave you with is that you can begin to practice the F word in all of your affairs. So start practicing forgiveness as often as you can. When we carry a resentment towards someone, it's like drinking poison. We are the one who carries around that negative belief system. We are the one who just keeps harboring that negativity. And we take that negative fear-based experience and we bring it into the present moment and we project it onto all the, all the other relationships that we have. That employer who fired us at some point, we bring that into the new job. We create the opportunity to be fired again. That relationship that was negative, we bring that into the new romantic relationship and we create more chaos in every corner there. So be conscious of how your resentments are holding you back and become clear and ready and willing to let them go. And so the practice of forgiveness can be very scary for people and so there's three simple steps I'll leave you with. And one of them is to become willing to forgive, witnessing who you need to forgive and be willing to forgive. The second step is to become conscious of your side of the street. How have you been participating in your negative resentment? Maybe your participation is that you've been unwilling to forgive. Maybe your participation is that you had some negative stuff that you did too. But be very conscious to clean up your side of the street, forgive yourself for whatever you did, but be aware of your part. And then the third step is to surrender and be willing to forgive daily. All you have to do in this third part is just to say to yourself every morning, every night, I choose to release you, I choose to forgive you whether it be yourself, whether it be another person, whether it be an institution, whoever you are, whatever you are willing to let go of. Say, I choose to forgive you, I choose to release you. And practice that mantra. Whenever that fear-based projection comes up, just set that intention one more time. I choose to forgive you, I choose to release you. And that moment when you make that decision, the moment that you affirm your desire to forgive, you awaken that inner guidance system. You reconnect with that voice. And you can be guided once again to the teachers, the assignments, and all the things that you need to allow that forgiveness process to occur. And you don't have to figure it out anymore. You just have to be willing and surrendered and allow the universe to show you what she's got. Okay? So that's, that, these are some just different tips throughout the book that I've given you now just to give you a broad overview of the different ways that I have been practicing the life of a spirit junkie and changing my own perceptions. And so today I do live a life beyond my wildest dreams. Today my job is to come and hang out at Google on an afternoon on Friday and be with people like yourself and carry these messages. Today I live an inspired life. Today I feel intuitive guidance all the time. All of my hangups have melted away. All of the things that I feel I need, I know they're coming or greater. And I allow this work to just grow and expand naturally because I live inspired. And so I hope for each of you to find a way throughout your life's experience to awaken your ing, your inner guidance system, and start to practice the spirit junkie way. And start to welcome your own perceptual shifts one moment at a time. So before we take some questions, I'm just going to wrap up with, I like to, at the end of all my book lectures, just read the last page and a half of the book to just give you sort of an insight as what happens once you start to live as a spirit junkie. So here we go. Constant contact with spirit got me here. When it came time to conclude this book, I found myself putting it off. I wanted to savor the last chapter, take my time, and allow the words to pour through me. And I did just that. I waited. I revisited all the chapters leading up to this point. Reflecting on the pages of this book, I was astounded to find that I didn't even realize what I'd created. There were stories and sentences that seemed as though they'd come from a higher source. I kept thinking, I don't remember writing this. This experience was a sure sign that I'd done good. I truly allowed spirit to enter into the process and guide me. Clearly, I hadn't overthought the contents of the book, but rather allowed the work to flow creatively from my inside out. This book is an extension of my spirit and all the inner guidance that I choose to work with. By listening to this guidance, I've enjoyed every second of the writing process. I've healed more, learned more, and loved more. I've deepened my relationship with spirit throughout the collaborative effort to create this book for you. 
Throughout my process of creating this work, I felt a presence by my side. Often a rush of energy would pour through my hands. Inspired ideas would come to me in the middle of the night. Human guidance was always present and new assignments led to authentic content. Each moment of the process has been guided and I hope you felt the presence of a power greater than me pour off each page. Each word, thought, and sentence is infused with spirit's love. Together, let's say thank you. We thank the infinite loving universe and the beautiful spirit that, thro that flows through each of us. We thank spirit for your guidance, your inspiration, your lessons, and your support. We thank you for reminding us to have faith in love. With endless love and gratitude, I send you off with the spiritual connection of your own understanding, a connection that will be yours to grow and share with the world, an, everlast an everlasting companion on your miraculous journey inward. May you release your fear, have faith in spirit, expect miracles, and always listen to your inner guide. So I will leave you with that. I will take any questions if anyone has them related to anything. I'm wondering. Any questions? Looking at you. Do you have a question? <laughs> Somebody's got to have some kind of question. I know you're in your office. Yes. What was that? How much do we have to achieve through meditation? Yes. I love this question. Thank you for this question. So, yes, there is a dramatic shift that occurs when you have a meditation practice. I, one day at a time, began to expand that practice. And it's much like going to the gym. So it's like when you first start working out, you feel you're sore and it's uncomfortable and you kind of hate going. But the more you go, the more it becomes second nature, the more you enjoy the practice, the more it becomes part of who you are. And so that was my experience with meditation. And so one day at a time, I grew this practice, which was five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Eventually, I'd get to a place where I could sit for an hour and just be in stillness. And what would happen for me was that I would lose track of time. Time became irrelevant. And I would open up that right brain, and I could create images in my mind. I could start to ins have inspired ideas come forward, s sort of psychic projections in many cases, knowing, seeing things like if I was working on a project, I would hear a strong intuition that would say, role model, or it'd say a word, or something would come through in my writing. And these conscious moments of divine inspiration became my, greatest, my next right action in my career or became a relationship I needed to be guided into. So what happened was I opened up this creative capacity to experience that guidance. And most importantly, I began to experience tremendous flow within my life. I started to feel at ease. So today, because of my practice, I wake up with a tremendous amount of ease. I wake up and I feel good. And in those moments when I feel out of center and off kilter, I know how to tune back in. So for five minutes, I can just go sit in stillness and breathe, set some positive intentions, and be back in that centered state. So it's really what happens when you have a meditation practice is that you learn how to recalibrate your energy in any moment, and knowing that this is your greatest tool, your body, your being, your energy, your spirit, is your greatest asset. And through meditation, you can begin to learn how to tune that dial that up, like tune into the frequency of a loving presence on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So the best gift that any of you could give yourselves in this world is a practice of meditation. May you find it. I hope you do. Anybody else? I knew I had a feeling that you guys might be a little quiet and introspective, but that's okay. So, so listen, if there are any more questions, I would love to take them. Yes, Christine. I so I Great question. Yeah. So what am I doing to manage my stress levels right now, you know, in general, in any area of your life, but especially being on a book tour and traveling a lot or whatever. And for each of you having 
high powered jobs, all the things you have to deal with, manage. For me, there's, there's several different ways that I stay in tune, like I mentioned, where I stay calibrated into a loving frequency. Uh, the first way, obviously, is through my meditation practice. The second way is through that conscious contact with my inner guidance system. So it's consciously speaking. Maybe it's an internal dialogue. Maybe sometimes it's saying it out loud. Maybe sometimes setting an intention by writing it in a, in a notebook. But consciously setting the moment-to-moment -moment intention to stay centered, to be in the moment, to be okay with whatever is right in front of me. If I start thinking about all of the cities I have to visit in the next 10 days or in the next three weeks, I will go nuts. But focusing on what it is, what's my next right action today? What is right in front of me? I'm really focusing into the present moment. And being in that present moment allows me to just be cool. I'm here at Google, I mean, this is awesome. I can't be here with you guys worrying about where I'm gonna be next weekend then I cannot be present with you. Then that stress level does get raised. Then I am not my authentic truth. I'm not my highest service. And I'm not being me. So focusing on the moment-to-moment -moment situations. And then most importantly, practicing forgiveness in all of the areas of my life. Because if I start getting resentful at others, then I lower my energy. I get sick. I cannot support what I need to do. So when I get pissed off because the airplane isn't on time, or I get mad because I'm not getting the feedback that I need to from my publicist, or whatever it is, I practice the F word. So I will say, you know, that gentle moment of I choose to forgive you, I choose to release you, and let go of whatever it is that I need to just let go of because I cannot focus on that negative stuff if I want to live and be this beautiful container to do this work. And each of you have massive, massive jobs and you must keep your channel, your instrument clear so that you can hold that work, feel good, be balanced, and have a vibrant life at the same time. So those are some of the tools I use. And stop, drop, and meditate. Yes, 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 that's a good one. So, so I have this moment where I stop, drop, and meditate. If I have these moments where I'm feeling like I'm all over the place, my message to myself is stop, drop, and meditate. And it's, you know, just go wherever you are. Sometimes I'll go into a bathroom and I'll just shut the stall and I'll say, I choose to release this. And I'll breathe for five minutes I'll, or five breaths, five deep breaths. A powerful meditation is just breathing into your feelings. Just identifying wherever you might be holding on to any discomfort. Join me in that right now. Everybody shut your eyes for a minute. Shut your eyes. You wanted to meditate. Let's meditate. Ready? Okay. So shut your eyes and sit up straight. Uncross your legs. Put your palms facing upward. And just take a deep breath in your nose and breathe out your mouth. And just identify any area in your body where you might be holding on to any discomfort or anxiety. And gently breathe into that space. Allow yourself to be present with whatever is coming up for you. And on the exhale, release. Continue this cycle of breath of breathing deeply into that space in your body where you might be holding on to any discomfort. Expand your feelings. Allow yourself to be present with that emotion. And on the exhale, have a beautiful sigh of relief. Just let it go. Take a deeper breath in, just expanding, feeling, and allowing yourself to be present in that experience. And on the exhale, release it even deeper. Take another deep, deep, deep breath in. Just honor, allow, accept whatever you are experiencing in this moment. And take one last deep breath and then release, and when you're ready, open your eyes to the room. Do you feel a little bit better, anybody? A little lighter? Yeah, I'm getting yeses, yes. That was 60 seconds, right? 60 seconds. I just tuned a lot of you up, right? You guided yourself. And so that power of just feeling your feelings, just being present with whatever is coming through you, just allowing yourself to open up that way of being, to open up your heart, and just be present with whatever you're feeling. A really, a really important message of being a spirit junkie is that it's not that we have to be happy all the time. Part of being really happy is being okay with our unhappiness, being okay with our difficult feelings, being accepting and comfortable being uncomfortable sometimes. 
And that's part of being a happy person. It's just allowing your emotions to be this beautiful rainbow of emotions. Allow them to come in, allow them to shift, and constantly work to recalibrate back to that place of happiness. And this is a practice, it takes time, and it takes commitment. And so I hope for you all, I hope for you all to just really awaken. Yes, one more question, good. Um, everyone can ask a writer this question. Cool. But in your you know, journey here, as far as what part do you find um, actually writing the paper plays in this mandatory, you know, through meditation and contact and all of yep. things and being present, but do you find it's required work to put pen to paper? Yeah, yeah, so Daily. great question. Uh, so is it required to put pen to paper as having a spiritual practice? Yes. So in my first book, Add More Ing to Your Life, I had three steps in 30 days for every chapter. So the Ing equation is rethinking, moving, and receiving times 30 days equals changing. Okay? So the rethinking was positive thoughts, and the moving was physical activity. So combining those two, followed by meditation. Every meditation I followed with what I call an Ing write, an inspired writing exercise, which is free writing just stream of conscious writing. One of the most powerful tools you can do when you begin to awaken this presence of your inner guidance system is to just stream of conscious writing exercises. Just get a notebook, a clean, beautiful notebook, and allow your pen to flow. Allow that inspired voice to come forward. Sometimes you hear it, but the best way to connect often can be to just write it out. So yes, if you do start your meditation practice, I would strongly suggest that you have a notebook by your side. And when you come out of that meditation, just give yourself five to 10 minutes of stream of conscious writing exercises, and so much will come forward. Thoughts that you may not have ever let come through. Don't just jump out of your meditation and pick up your Android, okay? Come out of your meditation and write for 10 minutes, and just let it marinate, and let that inspired movement come through you naturally, and put it on the page, and know that that is beautiful direction. So that's a great, great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Uh, earlier, you mentioned about using meditation to reconnect with your thoughts. Can you give me an example for that? Sure, sure. So, how do we use meditation to recondition our thoughts? So, what happens when we meditate is that we we tune into that creative part of our brain. We tune into that, and, and a, a more relaxed state occurs, right? So, interestingly enough, what happens is is that we start to raise that feeling vibration, but even if that negative thought continues to come in, the best thing to do when you sit with that thought is to not try to push it away. Just allow it to be present in your meditation. Allow it to come in, allow it to leave, allow it to come back, allow it to leave. When we start to get into this place of like trying to push the negative thought away and change the thought proactively, we create more negativity around it. It's kind of like you know fighting with a barking dog. It's like, you gotta just let the dog freak out, right? So the, the, the process of sitting in stillness, that chatter of vo voice in your mind will show up. It will be so loud, it will be so present, it will, be, it will wanna come in, you'll feel a little good, then it'll come re really loud. And so the main thing I suggest for you is just to let it be with you. Just let that voice be part of the experience. The same way you might be listening to the sounds in the room, you can listen to the sound of that negative voice. And just allowing it to be with you, the same way you allow that uncomfortable feeling to be with you, allows it to come in and allows it to go. But when you try to push against it, it's like pushing against the stream. You can't, you'll get bulldozed over, okay? So just allow it to be with you. And what you'll start to recognize is when you start to deepen that connection and that communication to your loving voice, you will have less faith in that fearful voice. And that is how the transformation occurs. So you have less faith in that voice. Now in my guided meditation albums, I also guide you to new perceptions. So I'll say, okay, imagine yourself in a loving, in a loving place. I'll take you on a journey through your mind so that you have that guidance. And that's a lovely way too, because sometimes your inner guide is not strong enough yet to lead the way. So you can have a loving guide lead you down a beautiful path and help you create this inspired vision that will help you transform those thoughts. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. So I'm going to hang out at Google. I'll stick around. If anyone has questions for me, feel free to come up and we can chat. And if anybody buys a book, I'm happy to sign it for you. Alex, anything else? Do you want to ask anything? You good? It was a real pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you so very much. Thanks for showing up for yourselves today. 
Thanks for showing up for your spirit junkie mentality. And I hope you all take even, if you take one thing I mentioned today, if you take one exercise, one message, I can guarantee miraculous shifts. If you apply one shift, one thought, expect miracles. Thank you very much.